Good morning. I'm David Shepard with Four Trust. I'm the Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing. I am proud to be able to introduce and privileged to introduce Jack Dangerman this morning, our keynote speaker. Uh, Jack is the founder and president of ESRI, the world's sixth largest privately held company founded in 1969 and headquartered in Redlands, California. ESRI is widely recognized as a technical and market leader in geographic information systems, or GIS, pioneering innovative solutions for working with spatial data. Jack is recognized not only as a pioneer in spatial analysis methods, but also one of the most influential people in GIS. He takes a leadership role in national and global initiatives to facilitate standards for data, data access and sharing across agencies and organizations. He is personally committed to applying GIS methods for environmental stewardship and sustainable, and sustainable communities. His work is focused on helping organizations deploy spatial data in enterprise environments, web-based services, and mobile computing systems. Today, Jack will speak to us about web GIS, geospatial enterprise business systems. Please welcome me and please welcome me, join me in welcoming Jack Dangerman. Good morning. I was just welcoming David. <laughs> That's good. Uh, thank you very much for coming, and also thank you very much for, for inviting me here. I don't know exactly what I'm going to talk about, but I have some PowerPoint slides, and I'll sort of wing it, go through little by little. How's that? Or, or I could start by saying, do you guys have any questions? And we could do it that way. Um, well, uh, all kidding set aside, this is a privilege because this meeting, and you particularly, in your various role, like you, are building a kind of future technology infrastructure here in Colorado. And that's, I take that very seriously. It's a serious commitment by you. And uh, it's intriguing to me that you are inventing and evolving the technology infrastructure for what ultimately will be, I think, a better Colorado in the future. Not that it's not nice now. Uh, I'm going to start off by making an assertion that GIS, the technology that I work with, is enabling the transformation of how we see and how we work with our world. It's, it's quite compelling at this particular stage in my career. I'm seeing it grow like I've never seen it before. And there's some reasons for that. One of them is the sort of popularization of mapping that Google and Microsoft have created and a broad-based understanding of how maps communicate. People are beginning to get it. And also, behind these maps, GIS supports spatial analytics. This is kind of like analytics that we see in BI, but it's leveraging the spatial dimension. How are things related? How do we interpret these in a quantitative way? Third, applications are making it come alive. They're, they're delivering real business value. And I have some users who are saving upwards of a half a million dollars a day in their business because they're using this kind of power and also spreading it across to their enterprise. And finally, it's becoming popular because the platform underneath it is transforming. So transforming, transforming. Maps tell stories. These are just a couple that I assembled on the way up here. These maps are telling stories, for example, in the lower left of Fukushima. This map was actually kept secret for a few months after the disaster in Japan. Finally, the map got out where the actual radiation was going, and the prime minister was fired as a result. And you can clearly see that the radiation plume went way beyond the couple of 10 kilometer circle that was drawn where they evacuated population. That's how, that's how radiation got in the milk supply and the food supply in Japan and created a huge catastrophe. So you can see how one map can tell an amazing story. You get it? Or the little red map in the upper left is showing hot spots of ecological diversity in South Africa. Or the map in the center is showing the best place for locating a large retailer, let's just call it the largest retailer in the world, store location, bringing all the geospatial analytics together and telling a story. That's where I want to go. Or climate change, what's occurring? 
or where the World Bank is spending money, that interesting black map, supporting transparency, and flood risk, and so on. So maps tell stories, and I wanted to start off my little talk here by saying that's one of its interesting um, characteristics. Also, maps, and more importantly, analytics and the full GIS behind it, deliver huge business value in the area of making organizations more literate spatially, therefore being able to allow them to communicate better and make better decisions. It's delivering value in places like agriculture or economic development or education. It's delivering value in emergency response and public safety, in site location of big businesses, in the oceans, in the land. It's a kind of infrastructure of information that is embraced inside of enterprises or organizations or governments to be able to help them make better decisions and become more efficient. And this is happening at lots of scales, <clears throat> at little community scales or in small businesses, in big global businesses. It's also happening in science, like this little um, simulation of climate change on the planet over the next 50 years. It's getting warmer. This will cause amazing implications for the world that your kids live in and grow up in. Geography is a kind of way to visually and spatially and mentally understand our world. It's also becoming a platform for, for large enterprises, just like ERP was, is, or CRM. Geospatial and GIS is becoming embraced by these organizations, not just in the geospatial department, but as a, as a language across the entire organization. It's also becoming a platform, let's call it an infrastructure platform, for government here in the US at the federal level, the geospatial platform is what our Secretary of Interior and the President now call it. It's one of their lead initiatives. And it's slow in coming, but it's being realized as an enterprise architecture, as is the government of Indonesia and China and India spending hundreds of millions of dollars to bring this infrastructure together as if it was a telephone network system. It's infrastructure. Today, our world is facing serious challenges, and I think you just open the paper on any day and all the stories, or many of the stories, are there. Does this bother you at all? Yeah, it does. But what are you doing about it then? Buying a Tesla car or something like that? I mean, yeah, you do your little thing, you try to do it better. But what is concerning me is that there's not any collective thinking about the future, the next 50 or 100 years. So. I think collectively, and I assert to you that we need to, we need to get it together. We need to think about how to create collectively in your organizations, working collaboratively, how to create a better future to address these sorts of problems. And this is going to take our best, our best people, our best technology. It's going to take our best science. It's going to take our best design thinking and creation to, to do that. Think out 100 years. Let's build a plan like we build a land use plan for the next 100 years for our country or for the planet or for at least our community, for God's sakes, or our organization that is actually sustainable. Well, in my, in my, in my little niche of the world, I've had this vision for a long time, decades actually, that this technology and the science that it's associated with can actually have a play in being able to do that kind of long-term planning. Today, GIS and what I like to call location analytics is already helping provide understanding of our world. Those examples that I showed show little niche pieces or stovepipes of it. But in a broader sense, this is a powerful technology because it, it's visual and people love it. It's also quantitative and analytic. 
so that I can actually model the future or model the circumstances. It's also systematic, and it's like the, like the science that it's built on, geography, it's comprehensive. It brings all the ologies together, geology, sociology, climatology, anthropology. It's an integrative technology in that sense. And the evidence is in these first 40 years that it's, it's providing a very practical means for people to get it, to understand the world, and also for action. One of my best friends, Richard Worman, who started TED, said understanding precedes action. So I think I'm in the business of understanding, <laughs> trying, trying to create a, a technology which supports the notion of, of understanding our world or our organizations to support systematic action. So the, the evidence is also clear that all of the users that are using this, and there are hundreds of thousands of them, are, are, changing, are changing the way we see, the way we think. Actually, this little bunch of words, GIS is changing how we measure things, how we, how we integrate our measurements, how we predict, how we design and plan our future, uh, how we make decisions. It's touching all aspects of how we think and how we act. It's not really scaled out there very far. It's still owned largely in niche sorts of spaces within organizations. Pretty powerful, no question about that, but it's not amplified or scaled out like something like GPS is. You know, GPS combined with consumer mapping technologies like my friends at Google or Microsoft do, they mean that, they mean that Individuals are no longer lost. You can travel in the world anywhere and never be lost anymore. I mean, that's pervasive <laughs> and interesting. So what I'm thinking is that this GIS and location analytics can become pervasive in the same way. And I'll try to lay out how that's going to happen. And if we do that, then our organizations, our communities, our society can also be never lost. We can actually bring it together to realize with geo-accounting, the not just the money accounting, but the accounting of, of everything else that we care about, uh, our environment, our families, our, our livability in cities, and so on. So GIS is actually being transformed, and it's being transformed as we speak by the same forces of technology that many of you are engaged in or working on cloud, faster machines, device patterns, usability in, in IT. And it's integrating imagery, it's integrating LIDAR, it's integrating all of our measurements, GPS measurements, increasingly in real time. One of my partners here in Colorado, Digital Globe, has pioneered the whole idea of, of bringing imagery alive almost in near real time, three, four, five hours after the satellite passes and takes a picture, it becomes available for my users, geo people, to be able to use and see the consequences of, say, disasters or hurricanes. All of these trends are emerging in a new pattern of GIS. It's like a rebirthing of many of the old concepts. And these new patterns are the app pattern, simple, easy to use apps that make maps, apps and maps that do analytics as well as not just fly around like Superman, but actually put information together and understand things. And that's fusing with social media. It's all kinds of intriguing characteristics are popping out of this web GIS. It's not a mainframe GIS. It's not a mini computer GIS. It's not a workstation GIS. It's not a PC GIS, it's not a client server GIS, it's not a server centric GIS, it's a web GIS. And this new pattern promises to do things like we've never done before. So today there are multiple architectures for GIS. The desktop's still the most pervasive with millions of users that hit the keyboards every day. That moved into a data CAN, a data centric architecture and client servers emerged. 
that moved into more intelligence on the server side with thin client and thick client access to web services, which were geospatially enabled. And that's now morphing, all of that's now morphing into this cloud web environment that I like to call a web GIS, which allows any client at any time to access, search, discover any kind of geo service and bring it together in mashups or analytics. You get this idea? Very simple architecture, but it has huge reach opportunities to make GIS pervasive. Web GIS is a kind of enterprise platform. So GIS professionals, these guys that build data sets and do analytic modeling, are now through this web environment able to share their information and make it pervasive and usable and useful to knowledge workers, executives, and so on right across the enterprise. And likewise, those people in those jobs are starting to learn, wow, this, I, can, I can make maps easily with my, in my spreadsheet or in my browser and leverage these services, not only inside my organization, but between and among different organizations all over the place. I'm never sure if I'm communicating or not. Do you guys get this notion? Oh, good, thanks. Helps me in my insecurity here. <laughs> um, this web GIS, let's start with this. It integrates any kind of data. It integrates traditional maps and imagery. It also integrates any kind of geospatially referenced services as web maps and web services. It integrates things like spreadsheets and turns them into map services. It integrates big old Oracle databases and turns them into map services. It integrates social media, which are geo-referenced, Facebook, Twitter, and so on, and turns it into map services, a kind of new medium. It integrates um, you know, real-time sensor networks and turns them into map services a kind of new language. And it deals with big data and hauls it out on demand as web services. This lingo franco or language is intriguing because it allows us to do GIS in a whole new way. Traditionally, GIS was about building an integrated database in a database can. This allows us to read in distributed services and dynamically integrate them, change projections and so on, and then use the information from a distributed network. And you can understand the implications of this agile architecture for bringing together disparate organizations like the state of Colorado or cities and states or one business with another business, share, sharing, sharing services. These kinds of shared services can integrate just about anything. A map can be hyperlinked to other kinds of documents. That's something of the 90s. Nothing new here. Uh, visual overlay, the kind of mashup technology, that really came out a half a dozen years ago with the whole Google environment. I could do mashups of different sets. The new, the new space is I can actually do integration and analytics of these mashups from distributed data sets. In other words, instead of having to put them all into a database can, I can live link, integrate, analyze, interpret this information. This is the heart. It's kind of like the golden ring of geography. I can bring the ologies together or the departments together and approach enterprise thinking, comprehensive thinking dynamically. And this has, in turn, implications for organizations. Stovepiped departmental or separate divisions of an organization can share their information around this and dynamically do integration and visualization. So the great tragedy of Katrina was largely that the organizations didn't collaborate. The city didn't talk to the state, didn't talk to the, but around Sandy, we see a different kind of response from FEMA and state and local organizations. And it was largely because 
the first responders were able to bring integrated information together and see what was going on with outage and with the hurricane and with all of that. So this is, we're right in the midst of a kind of turning point to web mapping, web GIS. Um, the NISC, an organization sponsored by the White House for re first responders has grabbed onto this pattern and will implement it bringing local and state and feds and and other first responders in the NGO space together dynamically. So I, I think this has integrative implementation capabilities that we have never, I mean, we've thought about it before, but we've never really been able to practically accomplish it. Your governor here, um, who's a really great governor, I had dinner with him last night. We were just thinking back on when he was mayor, and he had he spent a huge amount of money trying to get all the data together and integrating it into a database can. And he's lamenting how much that costs. And while it was worth it, he said it was really troublesome and sort of small p, politically hard to bring all of his departments together. I was sort of explaining this notion. He said, wow, wow, this will, this will transform what we're able to do in the public sector. And in the private sector, I think exactly the same thing will occur. And this pattern is being rapidly accepted in the World Bank, in the UN, in our national agencies in the United States, in a lot of states, and also in businesses like Shell Oil or BP. They're bringing all their little stovepipes together for support and, and enterprise enablement. This pattern means that there has to be <clears throat> available data served and a kind of living atlas is a way to think of it. I have a living atlas in the cloud that I can connect to. Some data is static, like soil maps. Some data is dynamic, like, like Digital Globe's dynamic imagery services or real-time traffic or like that. I can reach back and have nice base maps for the planet, but I can also have geodemographic data or environmental data that I can literally mash up and start analyzing with my own data almost immediately to create analytics. This makes GIS much easier instead of having to do all the work. I simply subscribe to a SaaS service of content, a living atlas, and make GIS enabled across the enterprise easily. WebGIS also allows us to deal with dynamic data. So this uh, is, called the tr is called the Geo Event Tracker. And it takes on the left-hand side, yeah, left-hand side, um, real-time feeds, like uh, people feeds, like social media feeds or sensor network feeds. It processes them with rules, doing things like geo-triggers, like I'm getting near this or not, or I'm getting into this bad zone or not. And then it sends out messages, like these this map shows all the real-time tracks of all the ships in the entire world. Every few seconds, they send out a message. When they're getting close to a harbor, a little email goes out, or an alarm can go off, or when bad guys get near an em American embassy, maybe an alarm goes off. <laughs> you get the idea. This, the application of real-time GIS is like wiring up our planet so that we can begin to, in real time, manage manage it better apps are the are the magical magical thing that make this infrastructure come alive apps for data collection for viewing for mapping for analytics for telling stories apps like uh, microsoft excel that just connect to the web maps and make maps of my spreadsheet or the like and those apps are being built by tons of people. Some of them are interested in things like crowdsourcing or citizen engagement in the public sector or talking to their customers more effectively. I have outage problems in New York City because of Sandy. I want to notify the utility about that. And so business to consumer, business to citizen, government to government, all of it uh, fits in this space. A lot of our work, this is my own colleagues' work and I, have been to get out of the just geospatial mode and start empowering the rest of the enterprise systems with this geospatial. Uh, this last year, we've released 
geospatial enabling for SAP and for Cognos and for all the BI platforms, as well as, 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 um, as things like Office or uh, SharePoint. So I can now geospatially from the web with SaaS services make cool maps or extend and amplify the power of BI with spatial BI, or that's what I call location analytics. Finally, these apps don't just happen, and it's one of the reasons why I accept coming here, is this, this Denver, it, this state of Colorado, is a kind of hotbed for, for new innovation. I mean, okay, we talk about the Valley, we talk about Santa Monica and Austin and New York City and Boston. You guys are starting to fall in that same vernacular of, of oh, let's, let's build things and, you know, like that. Uh, so, in addition to supporting GIS community and the enterprise, this year we are supporting enormously opening up, getting involved in GitHub, sharing our APIs and base software to developers, and this is really taking off. In, um, in opening up Geo so that maps can be in apps. And this whole new creative force that's occurring in our society can take advantage of Geo in a whole new way. Not just sort of consumer mapping stuff, but I'm talking about full analytics and enrichment that's necessary. And I'm, I'm hoping that this will, I'm more than hoping, I'm committed to the idea that we can bring geographic science into this whole world and take advantage of this in, in app development. So I, I want to conclude what I'm saying. I wanted to get across the notion that GIS, GIS is powerful. Uh, it's not something for the back office anymore. Over these last four decades, we've seen it move from a research computational geography curiosity thing to the idea that it became strong from an enterprise perspective. Where we're reaching at this point is that we empower all kinds of apps that cut right across society, especially within the enterprise like other enterprise computing environments. And I think uh, personally that that will have huge consequences on some of the challenges that we're facing as a society and in our organizations. So th th thank you very much for this chance. I think uh, Molly was gonna come up and say some departing words. Is that right, Molly? Or? Yes. So I'm Molly Rousey, CIO with Gagan MacDonald. And, and she's, um, she's great. Do you know her? <laughs> she is. She's amazing. That's very kind of you to say. I was uh, wincing a little when you talked about your conversation last night with John Hickenlooper. Yes. Because I was the CIO struggling with some of that behind the scenes trying <laughs> you, to deliver you it. You had to, to him, work, so. work with him. Yes. So thank you. No, so I, can, can you honor, tell us what that was like? No. <laughs> <laughs> Later over drinks. Later, okay. Yeah. 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 Um, but I'm currently the CIO of Gagan McDonald, and I wanted to open the audience for questions so that we can talk a little bit about some of the things that you brought up, Jack. I know so many of the people are struggling with enterprise architecture, with all of the new service-oriented architecture, web services, things like that. I thought that was especially interesting. So we have um, Amy on the right side, or my right, and uh, Tammy on the left. Do we have anyone with questions? Right in the front, perfect. Just wait until the mic comes and introduce yeah. your name. Uh, first. Eric Wolferman, um, Rocky Mountain Tech Line. Um, Time Magazine and Google Maps recently did a project in time lapse uh, uh, using maps and photography to show uh, environmental impact over a period of time. Uh, they showed, I believe, uh, the Las Vegas area and how that area was populated over a, uh, a, a time period and showed an ice shelf, I believe, and showed the receding ice over time. Is that type of application an extension of GIS? And, and what's your opinion of that sort of thing? Or is that a different kind of technology? Well, there's in my space, there's been two emerging technologies. One of them has been the traditional GIS, which is becoming more consumer friendly. Uh, the Google initiative has been designed to focus primarily on search, visualization, and opening up map, uh, a constant map for the entire planet to citizens. And it's pretty cool, too. So we're sort of living in different ecosystems, but we overlap a bit. 
that particular effort was built on the collection of Landsat information. So in 1972, I believe it was, uh, our government launched the first satellite for remote sensing that was available for non-military applications. It was called Landsat, and it has now gone through eight releases of, of information, about 30 meter resolution grid cells, think of that that way, or pixels on the planet. And that has been a source of science applications for years. Take a look at the city of Denver and watch it over time. Uh, take a look at the state of Colorado, watch it over time. And use multispectral characteristics of remote sensing and image processing to exploit knowledge. What Google did is they took all of that Landsat data and simply put it into a cloud and supported it with a simpler kind of consumer application so people could look through time at what the world was about. And I think it's really a mark of exposing science to consumers. That's what their big role has always been. And I, and I love that kind of contribution. At the same time, we are being challenged with next generation of investment in remote sensing. And uh, Landsat continuity, so that we, in 10 years from now, will also be able to look back 50 years instead of 40 years, um, that, that requires social investment. Well, one thing I also want to say about this is that the Landsat investments, which have been about a billion dollars a launch, have resulted in the emergence in the United States of a whole commercial remote sensing satellite community, like GOI and Digital Globe, they came out of that basic engineering and thinking. Uh, uh, mind you, also for the strategic um, missions of our, of our national government. Um, so these public investments benefit, I think, the private sector. They've certainly uh, benefited my users and our own company by bringing free content available to the world. They've, I'm sure, um, impacted my colleagues at Google and, and Microsoft. Um, they're also impacting us in terms of our understanding of a society uh, about our future. And then there's this other thing like this technology innovation has spurned new kinds of businesses like the one here in Colorado of Digital Globe. So uh, I, I like this commitment by our society towards systematic um, uh, me measurement over long periods of time. And it, it has uh, lots of values. I don't know if I'm wandering around a little bit, but does that help you? Good. Thank you. All right. Do we have anybody else? Over here. Hi, Adam. Hey, Molly. Um, I'm Adam Roderick from Aspenware. Uh, Jack, I really like your vision of the web-centric GIS uh, platform, and I get that. I think there's a, I would say most companies probably have GIS data that they could expose, yeah. but um, when it comes to publishing data, a lot of companies don't realize the value of their internal data and exposing that data externally. What's the message that all of us should take back to our companies about the benefits of of participating in this platform today and identifying the right kind of data? Yeah. Um, so ArcGIS is a product that I create. You guys, some of you use it. Some of you use it a lot. And it, it was mainframe, mini, workstation, PC, server, ser web services, now cloud. That product can be implemented in, in private clouds, so people like the intelligence community in our country or the army, they implement everything that I'm talking about, cloud or web-based GIS, in their own cloud environments. They don't trust their information on the outside. But even those communities have a hard time sharing across the different intel communities. Um, and cities often have the same little you know, turf wars or states have the same kind of turf wars that have plagued the advancement of GIS. So I'm rambling a little bit, but stay with me. Uh, first, web GIS is not simply, uh, okay, we put it all in the public cloud of Amazon and Azure, although you can share it not only in the public cloud, but also share within organizations the kind of behind the firewall cloud architecture. And uh, our own decision was to build products that run in both of those spaces. 
The public cloud has the characteristic of being able to share between or and among organizations, and like Digital Globe is doing, they're publishing services that are so-called premium services that can be purchased through subscription. So it isn't just putting it out there and it's free for everybody to use, although in some cases there, there are organizations that want to do that. Um, there's, there's also this idea of staying in business <laughs> Uh, by being able to charge for the services. So public, private, and then commercial and free or government or public supported kinds of categories are, are this. How that relates to uh, your businesses, I don't really know. I'm basically running a huge SaaS business. I have a half a million customers already for $500 a user or maybe $100 at volume. I could actually subscribe to all this content and use other people's shared content in the public sector. I can organize my geospatial content and make cool maps and run analytics now. Before I had to buy my own infrastructure, uh, I had to stand up my own servers. So the SaaS model is definitely part of my strategy. I continue to sell software and services with it. Um, then so I'm rambling a bit, no, not knowing exactly the nature of your question. Does that help you? So these are great questions. Changes in technology, changes in business models, changes in the world, and how we all interact. Thank you so much, Jack, for Thank taking you, so much time. Oh. oh, we do. I was just cut off, Shoot. and we got one more. <laughs> Hang in there. OK. OK, Good. one more quick question. All right. Well, thank you guys very much. Thank I, you. I, I absolutely believe technology can make not only a difference in business or make your businesses, you know, you can be an entrepreneur or, you know, that whole world. But I think the implication of what you do in the way of public service in the private sector particularly can have huge implications. And my whole life has been about that, and I, I like that. I, I feel good about that kind of contribution. It's about setting the right context for your life. I'm not just a business guy. I'm a, a person who's driving technology, even in a small niche or in a large niche. I'm driving it because I have a context of being, of being a global citizen. I want to play in, in the future of how we evolve. So thank you again. Thank you.